The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around Through the Spirit of the Lord is here The atmosphere The Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your love. Your love. Sir.
Come on, give him a shout. Give him a shout of praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. I'm a bit of an emotional mess right now. It made me think of Revelation chapter 5. When John had that vision around the throne room, and all of a sudden there was this angel that was holding the scroll with the seals, right, and, and John started to weep because no one on all the earth was able or worthy to open the seals. And then the angel said to John, don't weep for the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. And in that moment, John turned around thinking that he was going to see the lion, but he sees a lamb slain. Our God is so holy. And we start to sing about revival. And revival is truly nothing short of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who came to make a way for dead people to come alive, kind of like Ezekiel 37, where he speaks life into the dry bones and flesh comes on and the breath of God enters in. That, that's revival. It's, it's salvation. It's restoration. But when the church starts crying out for revival... I think we need to be aware of the cost of what that is. I just feel like the Lord just put that on my heart because when we cry out for revival and we say, spirit, fall down, fire, fall down. And if we understand this symbolism and the imagery of fire, we have to remember Leviticus, when fire comes from heaven, it consumes an offering. And we are to be that offering. So if we want revival, friends, listen, like you got to understand the cost that comes with that. And it's so worth it. We're supposed to give ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's our spiritual act of worship. Lord, here am I. Send fire. Send fire. Consume me. Last week we said that you can't plan a move of God, but you can surely prepare for one. And that's one of the best ways to prepare for one. When we worship, there's something that happens. It's like the Holy Spirit starts to season our hearts, to soften it, to make it pliable, where we're willing and moved to say, here I am, Lord, all of me. Like that's a beautiful way of preparing our hearts we can't force God or persuade God or coerce God to call out a revival. But he wants us to long for it. He wants us to yearn for it. So last week when we talked about revival, we saw the intimacy between revival and generosity. And I was asking the Lord, like, what, what kind of message can I give the church before I fly back? And the word stewardship came on my heart. And I'm not going to talk about stewarding our resources. I'm not going to talk about stewarding our time or our talent or our skills or our relationships because what I want to talk with you about is how do we steward our faith? How do we steward our faith? Because it's a responsibility of ours. Our faith is a gift given from God. Our salvation is a gift from God. We are saved by grace through faith. And this is a gift. We receive it. And when we say yes to the Lord, we are moved from death to life. And the Holy Spirit takes up residency inside of us. And then we are gifted with faith. And one of the ways that the church of Jesus Christ sees that is through spiritual gifts. And Paul tells us in Romans 12, 3, that we should use the faith. We should steward our faith to the measure that's been given to us. That's a stewardship. 
That's one of the best ways we can prepare our hearts for Jesus, for God to move. Now, I know there are times when God works without us moving in faith, but yet there seems to be this mysterious tension in the scriptures between our faith and how God moves. For instance, in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus wasn't able to do too many miracles in his hometown. And it says that he wasn't able to because of their doubt or their unbelief or their lack of faith. So it seems to indicate that there's a connection. And then there's other times when Jesus would say to other people, like, according to your faith, it will be done. We are told as believers that, hey, we no longer live by sight. We don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that it's impossible to please God apart from faith. It's impossible. In fact, faith is one of the reasons why we believe that God exists, right? It says that in there. And not only that, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Like, like, do you believe that when you seek God, he seeks to reward you? It's faith. How do we steward our faith? When we're invited to follow him, it takes faith. And we are to steward that faith. God has invited us to see the new things that he's doing in our midst. And that takes faith. And that's a faith that we must steward and God has entrusted the church with his mission to go make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. Well, that takes faith, and that's a faith that we must steward. And Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit and promised that we'll be able to do even greater things than him. Well, that takes faith, and that's a faith that we must steward. And faith is so much more than just intellect. It's so much more than just Bible study and saying, yeah, yeah, I agree with the things of Scripture. And faith is so much more than emotions. Oh, I felt something. Faith is both. But we're also told by Jesus' stepbrother that faith apart from works is dead. It's dead. And when you don't steward faith, just like if you don't exercise and take care of your body, your muscles will slowly atrophy. And here's the thing, God grows and strengthens our faith as we steward it. So before we get into the text this morning, I want, I want to pray. And I want to encourage you to pray for me, that my words are not my words, that we hear from the Holy Spirit. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would reveal your truth. Lord, I pray that you would stir up faith in this room, rise up faith in this room, just like what we see in the New Testament that like, Paul was able to recognize that the grace was there, that faith was present for you to heal and to work powers and signs and wonders. And Lord, so I ask that even now through your spirit, you, you would stir us up. Lord, I confess to you that the best I can bring today is water. And God, I need you to turn that into wine. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'm going to talk to you about how do we steward faith. And the best way I can think about how we steward our faith is by learning how to walk on water. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 14. And you can turn to Mark chapter 6 because it's the same story, two different accounts. Matthew 14. 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples to get into the boat and to go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray, and later that night, he was there alone. Every time I come across this story, it's the first three words that grab my heart. Immediately, Jesus made. Now, 
the context of when this story shows up. If we were to backtrack just a little bit, Jesus sent his disciples out on a short-term mission trip. He gave them his authority to cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And so they come back from that experience, and they're excited to share their stories with Jesus. And when they show up with Jesus, Jesus informs them of the sad news that John the Baptist just got beheaded. And so there's like this mixture of like joy and excitement and sadness. So Jesus wanted to take the disciples on like a little retreat to kind of recalibrate. But as they were gathering together and starting to move, next thing you know, there's this massive throng of people coming. And we hear that it's just 5,000, but we know it's probably like 15,000 people. And all of a sudden, Jesus is teaching them. And I can imagine the disciples going, oh, great. I thought we were going to have some time alone. We're tired. We want to share some good stories. We're sad. But then Jesus like, goes after a response of one of the disciples and says, hey, we should send them away. It's getting late. We don't want them to like starve, so let's just send them out so they can get food. And then Jesus, in his audacity, looks to his disciples and says, you feed them. I mean, like, Scripture's funny. Like, you, you just got to be like, are you kidding me? Like, if I was a disciple, I'd be like, wait, 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 Jesus, when you told us to go out, you told us to take no extra tunic, to not even take another pair of shoes, and you said, don't bring any money, and now you want us to feed them with what? And I can almost imagine, like, Jesus, like, they're, they're, they're thinking Jesus would be like, oh, you're right, yeah, 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 let's just send them away. But then Jesus is like, no, no, you feed them, go and see what you have. And then they feed thousands of people. You ever hosted a party? Ever hosted a party? Did you ever find yourself tired at the end of that night? Yeah, yeah. Like, imagine hosting a party of 15,000 and then being tired. And also, we get this story where it says Jesus immediately made them. It, it, the Greek in this phrase here, made, is like he forced them. Like, they didn't want to go. I don't know if they wanted to set up camp and just kind of like tent out, but Jesus is like, hey, get in the boat. I got things to do here. I'll meet you on the other side. And so then Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray. So they're out there now in the boat. Verse 24. Later that night when Jesus was alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. That's a nice way of saying it was a massive storm. Like, this, this is not like a little small little rowboat. It was, it was a fishing boat, most likely. And the fact that it was a struggle tells us that this was a pretty significant storm. And they were a considerable ways out. John's account tells us that they were about three miles. So they were halfway across the Sea of Galilee. And by the time that Jesus got them into the boat and the time when Jesus sees them in Mark chapter 6 struggling, they've been going at this for some time struggling in the storm. So they were been doing this for about six to nine hours. They were already emotionally depleted. They were already physically depleted. Jesus made them get into a boat. And now they're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of a storm, getting nowhere. Mark chapter 6, verse 48 tells us that Jesus saw this. <laughs> like, when you read a passage like that, when Jesus saw them struggling against the wind, like, I, I immediately go, Jesus, why didn't you, like, at that point, make your way to them? Like, they're struggling. Give them a hand. You already told the storm before to stop. Hey, you're on the mountain having a little prayer time with the Father. Why don't you just ask him to have the wind stop? But he doesn't. He lets them struggle the whole time. Have you ever heard the phrase, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will? You ever hear that phrase? I mean, like, it's true. Like, the best place and the safest place to be is always in obedience to what God has for us. But the problem is, is that we define the word safe. We, we, we like that word. Like, when I hear the word safe, I think of green pastures, quiet waters, no chaos, no anxiety, everything is calm. 
And then sometimes when the storms come, I'm like, whoa, maybe am I in God's will? Am I not in God's will? What's going on? Does God even care? Does God even see me? And then sometimes my theological snow globe, as it were, gets shaken up a little bit. But here's what we got to understand. Jesus immediately made them knowing ahead of time that they were going to face the storm. Jesus immediately had them get into that boat knowing that they were going to get stuck. He watched it. So it was God's will for them to row their boat into a storm. You need to know, friends, that not every storm you face in this life is of the devil. You need to know that not every storm and crisis and issue you face in this life is just random. Sometimes it's sovereignly, divinely appointed by God for you to go into that storm. And even if it is designed by Satan or just some random storm, listen, God is for us who can be against us and God will turn all things out for the good of those who love him so that he's always going to use a situation to grow our faith. So here's the first and most important principle when it comes to stewarding our faith. Listen to Jesus. And do what he says. Listen to Jesus. And do what he says. If he says, get in the boat, you get in the boat. And if he says, row, you row. And if he says, get in the boat, row, you're going to go into a storm, you row that boat right into the storm. We need to steward our faith through obedience. This is important because the disciples, they listened to Jesus and they did exactly what he said and they find themselves struggling. They didn't know that was going to happen, but Jesus did. And there's a purpose for it. Friends, this morning, are you in a storm? Are you facing issues in your life that you just feel like you can't get anywhere? Maybe it's parenting. You're like, man, I'm praying for my kids. I'm trying for my kids to do all these things. It just doesn't seem to get anywhere. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's an addiction or a sin issue. Whatever it is, are you in a storm this morning? Does it feel like you're alone in it? Where are you, God? I chose to follow you, and this is what I get. Maybe the safest place for you is in this storm. Listen to Jesus and do what he says because his greatest work in your life besides moving you from death to life, God's greatest work in your life is to grow and to strengthen your faith. God does not care about your comfort. We care about our comfort a lot. I mean, Peter writes this, brothers, don't be surprised when you face trials and tribulations of many kind. Because we know that this is producing something inside of you. And then he makes the connection to faith. Like gold is purified when it's refined in the fire. Like your faith, it's got to be tested. It's got to be tried. So if Jesus tells you to get in the boat, you get in the boat even though you don't know what's coming. He does, and he's good, and he cares. So you've got to steward your faith. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. And then the second thing we got to understand when it comes to stewarding our faith is that we have to, oh, friends, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. We have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because we have to understand that faith will always require risk. It will always require risk of some sort of level. And that requires confidence, but not in yourself. Not in yourself. Not in your strength. Not in your intellect. Not in your resources. But in Jesus. In his heart. And his power and his concern and his care for you. He is your good shepherd. He will lead you right. Always. Psalm 77 tells us that his way is through the sea, not around the sea. 
So sometimes when we follow Jesus and he calls us to something, you're like, I don't know if I want to do that. That's a little too risky. That feels uncomfortable. Well, friends, if you want revival and you want to steward your faith, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You have to. Living and rejoicing in our weakness that's not comfortable. I would rather rejoice and find peace in my strength. But we're to boast in our weakness. So if we steward our faith, friends, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Verse 25, shortly before dawn. So now this is about 5 a.m. The sun is just breaking the horizon. Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on a lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. They've been rowing, struggling against the wind for about six to nine hours. When they are absolutely exhausted and at their wit's end, Jesus makes his way. <laughs> Have you ever been sleep deprived? Like, you ever, like, stay up for, like, 48 hours, and then, like, you go outside at night, or maybe you're driving, and you start to think you're hallucinating, right? Like, you ever have that moment where you're like, what, did I just see that? And you're just, like, you're just so tired? These folks know the Sea of Galilee, and now they're seeing an aberration as someone walking on the water. It's a ghost. Friends, you would freak out, too. I don't think there's any of us who be like, oh, man, that's cool. Put up your phone. Let's get a little video. Nah, no, we would be like, Wah! and they cried out in fear. But here's the best part. Here's the best part. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, Jesus sees them struggling against the wind, and it tells us that Jesus intended to walk right past them. Like, did you, did you get that? Like, Jesus had no intention on stopping by. Like, I'm like, was he just so preoccupied from the events of the previous day? Did he just walk with his head down? Or was he just having a little prayer walk still and didn't see the disciples? Like, he meant to walk right past them. I don't know about you, but that rubs me wrong. I'm like, hey, help. <laughs> Jesus had no problem walking past them. He had no intention stopping them. He would have let them fight the storm all night. He wasn't going to intervene unless, unless they acted. They cried out in fear. They didn't cry out in faith. And this is where we go, God, thank you that you're so good. You are so compassionate. You're so gracious. They didn't cry out in faith. They cried out in fear. And immediately Jesus said, take heart. It is I. Scriptures tell us that as soon as we cry out, he hears. He responds. He knows that they think he's a ghost. And when he says, it is I, he's using the Hebrew name. I am. I am. Hebrew imagery always depicts the sea as evil, as chaos. And Jesus is just walking on it. And they're freaking out. They think he's a ghost. And Jesus says, I am. That would have brought up so many memories. Like Moses encountering the burning bush. Go to Pharaoh. I'm going to send you. And Moses is like, whoa, who do I say that sent me? And God said, I am. That's enough. Friends, I want to confess to you that when storms are raging in my life, it's hard to recognize Jesus. Isn't that true? It's hard to recognize him. It's hard to understand his presence. It's hard to see his hand and understand his purposes in the midst of all of that's going on. And sometimes the best we got in the storm is, save me. And Jesus will always, always respond, take heart, I am. I am. So good. 
Can we recognize Jesus in our storms? Verse 28. Use your imagination with me. You, you, you got to go like, you got to put yourself back into children's ministry for a second. You're a child and just imagine this, okay? Verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. <laughs> Peter. Okay, survey. How many of you would do what Peter just did? I thought so. None of us. Maybe one or two. You're, you're amazing people. How many of you want to, though? If the Holy Spirit's inside of you, I know. I know you want to because the Holy Spirit puts that inside of you. He wants you to move by faith. You ever have those moments where all of a sudden you just feel like this internal prompting or urging to pray for someone or to pray healing over someone or maybe God put a word of encouragement in your heart and you're like, I don't know, is that him or not him? And you kind of want to, but you're afraid to do it and so you don't and maybe you second guess. I, I, I love what Peter does here. He's inviting Jesus. Like He's like, Jesus, invite me to come to you if, it, if it's you. Like, here's how I want you to prove that it's you. Tell me to come to you on the water. That's not the sign I would ask for. I'd be like, Jesus, if it's you, can you stop the storm, please? Like, can you, like, snap your fingers and get us to the other side? Because I'm tired of rowing. Like, there was something inside of Peter that wanted to be where Jesus was. There was something inside of Peter that he wanted to do what Jesus was doing. So, Lord, if it's you, it's not tell me. It's not invite me. Jesus, if it's you, command me to come. What's the first principle of steward their faith? Listen to Jesus. Do what he says. Second, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's going to take risk. Ooh, that's a risk. So Jesus said, come. That's it. No other word. Nothing else. Come. So the third principle in how we steward our faith is this. We must have the courage to move on one word from God. Just one word. Come. That was enough for Peter. All right. What would change in your life today if you had the faith to move on one word from God? Forgive. Confess. Heal. Go. Share. What would change in your life? Confession number two. I expect Jesus to do a lot more than just to say, come. I mean, right? Like, nobody ever in human history has ever walked on the water. Nobody. And let's not forget that the storm is still happening. Like, I would expect Jesus at this point to give Peter a whole list of instructions, right? Okay, Peter, great. Come. All right, here we go. Now, as you get ready to walk on water, first and foremost, lock eyes with me. Keep your eyes on me the whole time. Don't look to the right or to the left. Right here, okay? So now, Peter, I need you to get a firm hold of something because it's rocking. I don't want you to slip because the water, you know, is slippery. So now I want you, as you get your one foot over the railing. Now, understand, Peter, water doesn't feel the same as rock, okay? Because, like, you've never done this before. So, like, just slowly get your foot on it. Just, just get yourself used to it, okay? All right, good. Good, Peter. You got that foot on there. Now get the other one over. Like, that's what I would expect to happen, right? Like, I want Jesus to give me a list of everything. Give me the directions. Give me point A. Give me point B. Give me point C. Then I'll follow you. But that's not how faith works. He gives us one word. He says, come. And that was enough. I mean, Abraham, the father of our faith, right? Also in Genesis 12, he's told to go to a land that I will show you. 
Where were we going? I'll tell you when we get there. So I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your friends. I want you to leave your livelihood and your culture. Let's go. All right. That's faith. But we have this tendency that we got to know. we got to know. Lord, if I, if I do this, will you actually do it? Like, God, like, what will happen if I make this decision? God, what will happen if I, like, start to talk to Jesus? Like, what will happen if maybe, like, I went street preaching? Or what would happen here? Can you just give me all of the steps? That's not how faith works. And the beautiful thing is, what if this whole what if game that we play works both ways? Right? But most often when we think of what ifs, we, we tend to lean towards fear. Like, oh man, like what if I step on the water and I sink? Or like what if I try to pray for healing and it doesn't happen? Or like what if I choose to be generous and now I don't have enough money? Like what if, what if, what if all these things happen? But friends, that what if scenario works the same way towards faith. What, what if God is faithful? What if I actually walk on water? What if that person does get healed? What if revival does break out? What if God also pours out? Like, it works both ways. And so I want you to think about it as like one of those scales, like the justice system scales that has the few things and you put the most weight and it leans this way. It's faith and fear. We tend to put most of our effort into the fear. And it goes this way. But God wants to grow and strengthen our faith. And sometimes he'll lead us into the storm so that we will place more of our trust into faith, into what he says, so the scales always tip towards faith. But here's the thing. Many of us would love, really we would love to walk on the water, but we like this more. I'd rather take it easy. I, I, I want the preacher to tell me these stories. I want to hear things. In fact, I love hearing stories about other people walking by faith. That's amazing. And all we just, we want to, but we don't do it for some reason. Like we're just too afraid to take that risk. And so we choose to be here. Friends, do you know who are the most critical of those who walk by faith? These people. I didn't like Pastor Fred's sermon. I mean, it was good. The three points were awesome. But that fourth point when he said that is like, lights were too bright. Sound was too loud. Man, I don't know. They want me to do too many things. Small group, I'll show up on Sunday. You will never steward your faith here. In fact, a lot of times, like, the disciples were like, hey, Peter, Peter, stop. Nobody walks on water. We don't do this. We don't do this, Peter. Well, yeah, I've been going to church for years. We don't pray for revival. Well, we don't, we don't evangelize. Like, you guys are crazy. Calm down. Would you? Here's the sad thing. We know this one a little too well, don't we? Because I'm willing to bet that God has given you one word to do something, and you're like, I don't know. I haven't gotten instructions yet. I don't feel good yet. I'm not ready yet. But we will never steward our faith by sitting here That's why we have to have this constant commitment to always moving forward in the face of fear. Always. No matter what. Regardless of what people will say, how people will criticize, what people will think, or what others will think, even if you don't feel ready, if persecution comes, whatever. It doesn't matter. You keep moving forward. Because that's what Jesus invited us to do. And here's the thing. Peter never walked on water. I played a trick on you. Peter never walked on water. Some of you are like, wait, wait, you, you just read that. No. Peter walked on the word. He walked on the word. Because if Jesus didn't say come, Peter can't walk on the water. But Jesus said come. And so he's walking on the water. 
because Jesus said come. We have to walk by the word. We are called to walk on the word. That's faith. Every step of faith is going to be the same. It never changes. We always move forward based upon God's word. That is fact. If God says it, we do it. If God says it, we do it. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. We will walk on the water as we walk on his word. And then the sad part is something happened to Peter in verse 30. When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Now, it's not like all of a sudden the storm resumed at that moment. Peter was walking on the water when the storm was happening. He was wave surfing. Like, I got to imagine. It wasn't like just smooth, like, like right? Come on, you got to imagine. It's like he's going up and down. He's walking to Jesus. But then something happens. It's like the human logical flesh system kicks in. He turns and he looks at the winds and the waves. All of a sudden he starts to think, what am I doing here? This is crazy. I shouldn't be doing this. And he starts to sink. What happened? His eyes shifted. He's now walking by sight. He's walking by sight and he's sinking. The moment we stop walking by faith, we start to walk by sight, we sink. And I love God's grace. It's so beautiful that as he went down, he cries out immediately and Jesus saves him and he pulls him up. And then he gives what I would say is one of the most beautiful exhortations ever. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and I know sometimes in our own sinful flesh, we want to read that as if like Jesus is mad at Peter. Like, Peter, I can't believe you doubted. And I read this, I'm like, if that's the case, and if water walking is little faith, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I don't even want to know the size of my faith. That that's not what Jesus was saying. That's not what he was saying. He was saying essentially like, Peter, I'm pleased with your faith, but I'm not satisfied with it. I'm pleased that you got out of the lazy boy and you took a risk. I'm pleased that you said, if it's you, command me. And I'm pleased that you took that step. And Peter, I'm even pleased that you got as far as you did. But don't doubt Friends, if you want to steward your faith, you have to rest in the grace of God, which means you have to understand that you're going to fail sometimes. Like you're going to all of a sudden, like you're moving strong, you start well, and even halfway through it's good, but there's going to be moments where you're moving forward with God that doubt starts to creep in. There's going to be moments where suffering or struggling or waywardness starts to show up. You have to rest on his grace. Because when you fail, and when we are faithless, he's faithful. If you don't stand in his grace, you will never steward your faith. You just won't. You will choose that chair every time. You don't need giant faith. You just need genuine faith. You just need genuine faith. Jesus, if you say it, I'll do it. That's genuine faith. You don't need to, like sometimes, like I do this, like during a worship song, like I'll try to like conjure up faith inside of myself. Like, come on, Brandon, come on. I'm not feeling it, come on, just sing harder. He's like, no, that's, that's not faith. That's like almost like superstition, like, once I feel something, then all of a sudden I'm good? It's like, did God change in that moment? No. Watch how this ends. I'm going to end with this. Verse 32. And when they climbed into, boat, into, when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. When did the storm stop? 
when they got in the boat. What does that tell us? That Jesus gave Peter another chance to walk on the water with him. Come on. Like when we fail, he's like, come on, let's go. And he walks with Peter back to the boat in the midst of the storm. And when he gets into the boat, the wind stops. Praise God for his grace. Come on. In, in as much as like Peter's the one that did it, the story's not about Peter. It's not about Peter. It's about the faithfulness of Jesus. He made them get into the boat. He told them to go to the other side. He walked on the water. He said, come. He's the one that rescued Peter. He's the one that walked with Peter back to the boat, and he's the one that stopped the storm. It's his faithfulness. And so I want to ask you, which one of the 12 do you want to be? Because there was only one who got a very unique experience of the power of God. And there were 11 who were here. They saw it. They heard it. They told the story of it. But they never experienced it. Peter did. We can't plan a move of God, church, but we sure can prepare for one. So I want to encourage you, steward your faith. Steward your faith. Is I just want to read Hebrews chapter 12 as a prayer of blessing over you. Because I, I do truly love you all. You're very much knitted in my heart. And I want to see the Lord. I want to see the Lord do something here. So would you stand and receive God's blessing? I just want to ask for you just to open up your hands in a posture of receiving. Hebrews 12. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, people who are commended by faith, who still say to us, you can do it, new life. There's a cloud of witnesses that have gone before you that are saying, Jesus is worth it. He is worth it. You can trust him. He's your good shepherd. Even if you are in a storm, and even if he leads you to the storm, he's faithful. Since we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in their hearts to throw off anything that slows them down in this race. Any anxieties and cares and concerns. May they remove the sin that entangles them, that trips them up. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower them to run this race with perseverance, the race that you've laid before them. Every single person has a specific calling, a specific purpose that you've put in their hearts, but also as a church. Lord, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would move in them. I pray, Lord, that you would cause them to always have their eyes fixed on you, that they would learn and continue to learn how to live by faith, walk by faith, not by sight, and to look at you as the author and the perfecter of our faith. You are the great example, our Jesus, the great model, and it was for the joy that was set before you that you endured the cross. Your body was broken and your blood was shed and you did it because of the joy that was set before you because you knew that would make a way for us. You scorned the shame of the cross. You took our shame. Holy Spirit, I pray that the gospel takes significant roots in the lives of these people. You sit down at the right hand of the throne of God 
And consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Lord, you call us blessed when we are persecuted. You called us blessed when we face trials and struggles and criticism. And Lord, I pray that just like you, you didn't grow weary and you didn't lose heart. Lord, I pray for this church that as they keep their eyes on you and as they steward their faith, they would never grow weary. They would never lose heart. So Lord, would you do more than they can ask or imagine? In Jesus' name.